Welcome to Right Now Workshop Podcast, where you can write a book and change the world. I'm your host, Kitty Buchholz, and this is episode 220, Writing with Deeper Meaning, an interview with Davis Bunn, coming to you on Thursday, November 5th, 2020. We're into November. Are you writing with National Novel Writing Month? Happy NaNoWriMo to you if you are. (laughs) And if you're doing some other kind of writing or editing or thinking and note-taking and researching, I hope you are enjoying whatever phase of the book uh, process that you're in right now. Every phase has its joys and its challenges. Uh, But I have to say, uh, National Novel Writing Month happened to coincide with me being ready to start a new book. So I am harnessing the energy of hundreds and thousands of people writing at the same time. Hundreds and thousands, yes, but I actually meant to say hundreds of thousands. Like um, I think last year there was more than 300,000 people worldwide writing a book at the same time. That's a lot of writing. It's kind of amazing. So uh, I happen to be like right in the right spot. In November 1st, I wrote uh, more than one 30th of the 50,000 words. So I wrote something like 1,870 words. And on the second, I wrote uh, something just over the 1666, like 1680 or whatever. So, um, so far, so good. I'm making my word count so far. Um, Getting lots of writing done, feeling really happy, enjoying my characters, enjoying all the bits and pieces of um, just unexpected bits that happen when you're writing the first draft. I love that stuff. I also love the editing and I love the putting it together and publishing it. I love all of the stages. And at some point during all those stages, I say, this is my least favorite stage. So I'm sure in the next couple of weeks, I'll be like, oh, I just remembered writing a rough draft is my least favorite stage. I just forgot about it. (laughs) So keep in mind, wherever you're at and however you're feeling about your writing this minute, It's normal. You just need to work through it. You just keep on going. Think of some really good part about it so that you can keep your mind in a positive place and just keep on going in this positive energy direction. And you will get to the end of whatever stage that you're at and look back and go, that wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was. And in fact, I kind of like it. (laughs) That's one of my other favorite parts of writing a book, looking back and going, oh, all right, that kind of turned out almost as good as I wanted it to. (laughs) I hope that you're enjoying your writing. This is going to be a great interview for making you feel inspired, honestly. Um, I love talking to Davis. He's one of my favorite people to talk to because he just, um, he makes me feel uh, like we're having profound discussions. And I love that. I love having philosophical discussions and, and talking about, you know, how we can change the world by really digging into stories. And I'm not sure that we actually said any of those things in the interview, but it's how I feel when I'm talking to him. So if you want to just be inspired, I think this is going to be a great interview for you. Um, Also, as a little bit of feet on the ground inspiration, um, I am opening up my Finish Your Book membership group for the month of November for anybody who's participating in NaNoWriMo. We have three writing sprints a week that we do on Zoom. And then we also have once a month, a guest speaker who is somebody who's published a lot more books than the rest of us and um, can give us, you know, like a different perspective, another point of view and do a Q&A. It's also live. So you can ask questions right there in the moment. And um, basically, I want to show you how much more that you, you can get done when you're doing writing sprints with other people, because I think it's a huge part of keeping us going, especially If we are working alone, writing alone, and as a lot of us are right now, even me here in Sweden, um, pretty much asked to stay home. So uh, there won't be any social interaction for me for a whole month. I don't know what I'll do except for, I guess I'll have to write more. So if you need just a little bit of social interaction with your uh, with your writing, since we can't do live in-person write-ins, um, you can join us and do these Zoom write-ins. Uh, they last for about 45 minutes. We do 30 minutes of sprinting, but it takes about 45 minutes for people to say, I'm ready, and then go around and, 
everybody tells their word count. So if that sounds interesting to you, go over to rightnowworkshop.com forward slash writing coach. And it's one of the options on that page. You can sign up. You can reach out to me by email, kitty at kittyboohaltz.com or find me on Facebook or Twitter, keeping in mind that even though I'm on Twitter less, I get those messages immediately. I've never found anything in like a Twitter spam direct message area. Um, however, I have found messages in Facebook in like a filter area that were from like three years before. So just keep that in mind. Even though I'm on Facebook more, if it puts you in a spam place, it may be years before you connect with me. <laughs> so whatever you're doing, find some time to write. And if it means eating more sandwiches and spending less time doing other things, do it. Because this is the best time your book could be the one that changes people's lives. And that is worth the time. And I think that's one of the things that you'll get out of this interview too. And in addition to all the inspiration and all the motivation to get more writing done, I want to say, I love this book. Uh, Davis has a new book out called Burden of Proof. And we talk about it during the interview. So you'll hear the title again, if you want to just pause this and go look it up. It just came out two days ago. I loved it so much. I could not stop reading it. It was so interesting. And I don't want to say too much because I don't want to spoil it because when things happen that you didn't know were going to happen, you're like, oh my gosh, this is cool. So you have a book to read. You have this interview to listen to. You have some words to write and you um, should get together with me or someone else and do writing sprints together this month. So lots of things on your to-do list, right? But be calm be positive, be upbeat, hang around people who are upbeat, especially this month. Um, we just need to uh, keep our positive energy going. And we can do that if we do that together. So hang in there and get inspired now here with Davis. Today's guest is Davis Bunn. Davis is the award-winning author of numerous national bestsellers with sales totaling more than 8 million copies. His work has been published in 20 languages and his critical acclaim includes four Christie Awards for excellence in fiction. He and his wife, Isabella, live in England. Welcome, Davis. Thank you so much, Kitty. It's great to be back. Oh, thank you so much. And like you said, great to be back. You have actually been on the show before, but not as Davis Bunn. Yeah. Yeah. So Thomas Locke is your alter ego pseudonym. Yeah. We, we, we may actually be amalgamating the two because of the work on the film side. It's, um, we're, we're actually in the middle of discussions right now with the publisher as to whether the science fiction or speculative fiction segues over into Davis Fund. So right. watch this space. We'll let you know what's <laughs> happening. Excellent. Very good. Well, just in case people uh, can't remember from, uh, I think it was around a year ago, I didn't check, but something like that. Um, give us just the quick nickel tour of how did you first get started writing and how did we get to here? And then we're going to talk about your book and writing. Your new I don't book. think we did talk about this. Oh, okay. Um, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> back before the dawn of the modern era, I started working, I was um, actually running a consulting company in Germany and had reached the point very early on that I was um, not fulfilled, that it was not something I wanted to do with the rest of my life, but I had no idea what that was. And I had a very dear friend who was a, a very successful, both the jazz drummer, but he and his, uh, his team were making ends meet by becoming what, again, this is back quite some time ago, they were the number one producer of uh, music for television advertisements. Oh, wow. And the real money in television advertisements comes from the people who actually produce the music, not the musicians. So they decided that they were going to set up the first digital recording studio in Germany. Wow. And I helped them set up a business plan and basically got to be friends with all of the people that they were bringing in as studio musicians and realized that it was this, and I had been a musician of much lower quality when I was in high school. And um, I realized that it was this artistic correction, this, this, um, 
different perspective on life that I was really missing so much. And I'd always been a reader and I decided that I was going to try to write. And it was literally the first day that I started putting down a story that I realized this is what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Wow. So I wrote for nine years and finished seven books before my first was accepted for publication. And um, that went on to become a national bestseller. And then after that, I had four books that almost <laughs> almost ended my career. It was just this roller coaster ride. Oh. And um, yeah, so I have been a full-time novelist now for 27 years. Wow. Ah, uh, what a story. I love it. <laughs> Oh, okay. I have. So, a... Let me just, I think I need to say a little bit about Thomas Locke since we brought that up. Yeah. The reason why Thomas Locke was started in the first place was because I have always been very prolific. I write a minimum of four, a minimum of four full length projects a year. And my publishers at the time, Baker, um, did not want to have four books of mine coming out. It, it, they just, and it was in two different, completely different directions. So they basically asked if I'd be willing, they wanted to take these speculative fiction novels and they said, would I be willing to do it under a pen name? So I did for 10 books, but Baker is now ending their speculative fiction. And at the same time that this is happening, literally the same year that I started writing the spec fiction, I also started writing screenplays very seriously. And now that work is taking over about half of my time. Wow. So my new publishers are saying basically they want to join the two together again. So I have mixed feelings about it. Thomas Locke has become a part of my life. I've been doing this now for six years. Yeah. <laughs> but we'll see. We'll see. But just watch this space. We should know by this time next year, we should know what's happening. Yeah. And I know that part of the reason people do um, pen names is when something is so different from what else, from the other things they've written. And yet um, some of the first things that I've read of yours from 20 years ago, maybe, um, you know, you, in my mind, like as a reader, you do write several different things. And I know that I need to read the back cover copy to see what it is, because it's not always going to be the same thing. Like, there used to be there used to be a lot of writers like this that would write both in the historical vein and in the science fiction vein or do historical and war and romance like um, Irwin Shaw, um, Leon Uris. Um, now the names escaped me. Yeah, yeah. Herman Wook, that's who I was thinking of. Oh. He was one of my favorite writers when I was just starting off. But the market has become so segmented and the attention span is so brief now that the people responsible for selling books into the market feel increasingly that an author can only be successful if they are very specific, if it's just one genre. The question is, and this is getting back to what you just said, the question is for someone who is established, is it possible to amalgamate these different groups and have the audience, the readership trust that they will continue to carry the quality in going in these different directions. And my current book, the one that we're supposed to be talking about today, Burden <laughs> of Proof, is a pretty good example of this because there were people in the publishing house, including my editor, who were very worried about the fact that it was a just a completely different orientation than what I had done for Baker under my my real name for 10 years. Yeah. But we'll see. We'll see. Wow. Okay. Well let's let's that's a great segue. Let's talk about it a little bit. So burden of proof, um, by the time this goes live, just came out two days ago. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and I told you beforehand I was really nervous about like saying too much about the book because I read it without being able to read a back cover copy. There was no no back cover copy. It was just an advanced reader's copy. So I start with chapter one, page one. And I was so in love with this story. I mean, the whole time I'm just like going, what is going, this is amazing. You just happened to hit a whole bunch of very happy notes for me. And so uh, let me let you describe it a little bit. And then we'll talk a little bit more about how you totally ruined my productivity when I was reading your book. <laughs> 
Um, well, the, the main character is Ethan Barrett, and he has this unexpected opportunity very late in his life to actually re-enter his own past. Um, and he discovers in this point, unexpectedly, he goes because there is this crucial issue that he feels was one of the deciding factors that effectively shaped his future as an adult. And that was the murder of his brother. And Ethan, in many respects, never recovered from the sort of cascade of events that happened following this. So what he originally does when he's offered this opportunity to go back um, is he wants to save his brother's life. But what he discovers is actually the real issue is saving his own um, because this journey towards closure of one thing becomes this, this huge opening where he realizes just how many things have to be corrected as a result of this. Um, he, he's, he's replayed the scenes in his mind a thousand times. He's um, long since at this point in his life before this happened, that there's a real disconnect between the man he should have been and the one that he became. Um, two lost opportunities basically framed his life, as I said, um, from looking back 35 years later, the heart-rending shift uh, one summer morning in a surfing contest that he should have won, but he lost the competition. And then three weeks later, he's unable to save his brother's life. So these missing chances basically frame his existence, even at the point when the story opens, which is 35 years later. He is shaped by what did not happen. And his existence plays out a beat too slow, basically, until that morning when Ethan is granted the impossible and has a chance to go back and relive those dreadful weeks. But the further he becomes involved in this new life, the clearer one truth becomes above all else. And that is no matter how many times he's given the chance to relive his life over again, he risks becoming trapped by the same errors and failings that marred his previous life. And they have nothing to do with the issues that took him back. It's not the contest and it's not his brother. It's who Ethan is. And that is really what shapes the story is this growing realization that he's got to grow beyond who he is and who he was at that point. Yeah. Before anything really important can happen as far as change is concerned. Yeah. Ah, oh, and you know, your, your uh, description is um, focusing on the interior journey, which um, w was the richest part of the book. But I have to say the plot was amazing <laughs> <laughs> and the plot would not have been so interesting if I wasn't constantly watching him try to figure out, am I going to make the same sort of um, choice and look at these people the same way that I have for my whole life? Or am I going to try to look at people differently and look at myself differently? So the two definitely were totally blended to create the story that you created. And I, I loved it so much. <laughs> I really appreciate this, this that. What, I, what I felt like really made this work and it, it happens um, we, before we went on, we were talking about um, a, a really, really great movie where <laughs> there's this unexpected twist at the end. And the only way that this is possible, where you have that boom sort of moment, is if throughout the story, there are not, there, there is not one arc, but there are two that are sort of this ribbon that moves together. So you have on the outside, you have Ethan trying to resolve the murder mystery. Why was his brother killed on a courthouse step? And how does he keep this from happening again? Because as soon as he gets started, Ethan realizes it's not just about this one day, this one shooter, this one event. It's the fact that something they aren't seeing is taking place on a much larger scale that creates not just a risk on that day, but it frames 
this threat to both of their lives moving forward. It isn't enough to, to save his brother's life. He's got to uncover the mystery. So there's that mystery on the outside, and then there's the mystery on the inside. And when you have these two moving together, the interior and the exterior plot, then you can arrive at a point where basically you think everything is resolved, but in truth, it really just opens it up for that unexpected bam. And that's, that's what I was after. So it's yeah. nice to hear that it happened. Oh my gosh. It was, I, I got to the last page and I was thinking, this is exactly the way I wanted it to end. And, <laughs> and I loved it because I, um, honestly, okay. <clears throat> so I think most of my listenership knows that I'm a Christian. I try not to make like a huge deal out of it. This isn't a Christian podcast, but I mean, this is about me and the things that I think. And, and so it comes out. And one of the things that I was thinking was, I don't think I've ever read a book published by a Christian publisher that didn't, um, feel like it had to say God in order for me to understand that we're talking about eternal choices and that sort of thing. And, and I was just wondering, like, was that, um, was it, was it a issue for your publisher? Did, did they care that you, I mean, at one point he was even talking to a surfer who, um, who was going to become a pastor or had already started becoming a pastor. I'm not sure because of the time change. Um, and even that fellow, like he, he talked in words that weren't churchy words um, when talking to Ethan, the main character. And I just really, um, I liked the way that the book just felt like my real life, not like it didn't feel like a Christian book. It felt like I was in the middle of, of a world that I could see being real all around me. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> yes, it does. Um, there are there are two different elements here on the commercial side. Um, four and a half years ago, I had to think on the time, I started working with Kensington, which is a sort of a satellite uh, publishing arm of the Penguin Random House conglomerate. And their hope was that I would be able to shift over from writing specifically for the evangelical community to writing stories that had that sense of um, deeper meaning, but were intended for effectively just mainstream anyone. And I had been working towards this for quite some time and some of the books, not all of the books that I had been writing, but having this as a purpose and having a New York editor has really helped shape this because um, basically she's only concerned, my editor in New York is only concerned with one thing and that is growing the audience. And whether, you know, she's working with me one, uh, uh, one week she's doing the Davis Bunn book and the next week she's doing the Shades of Grey book and the next day, the next week she's doing a romantic gothic horror story. Uh, and it, it just comes down to whether she can make these books a success in a very difficult market. So my responsibility was first and foremost to, if I, you know, I signed the contract, I am stating co a commitment to this particular type of direction. So when I started Burden of Proof, and that's an interesting story, I'll come back to that in just a second. But cool. when I started Burden of Proof, um, I had done four books for Kensington. And that made it a lot easier to, to work through this. Basically, what I wanted to do with Burden of Proof, as far as the underlying message, was to create a prodigal son type of story, where the son is not brought back to the father in that sense, but rather the son is brought back into wholeness with himself. So that was, that was the story. The, the interesting thing that I was going to say about Burden of Proof was, um, okay, normally, nowadays for a book to go through the publishing cycle, getting ready to go to publishing, getting ready to be released. 
the publishers want to have the manuscript a minimum of 12 months in advance of its release date because there's so much that has to happen both in terms of pre preparation and the marketing and sales side. Mm -hmm. So uh, the book is coming out on the 3rd of November and um, in August of last year, I received a uh, memo from the head publicist at Baker Revell saying, um, when can we expect your style sheet? And the style sheet is basically, it's like, this is what I think the story is about. These are the characters. This is how I would like to see the, the cover and so forth. Okay. And I wrote back and I said, style sheet for what? I, <laughs> I didn't have a book that was scheduled for release. At least I didn't think so. And my editor and the head of the company came back and said, well, actually, we've got you down for a book that's being released um, in this October, November date. And um, this, by this point, it was, I think, the first week in September. It was after Labor Day. And they said, but it's OK. What we'll do is we'll just shift you over until the Christmas period of 2021. And I said, no, I don't want to have that long a period between my releases. So when, how long do I have to get the book to you? <laughs> and at this point, I didn't even have a, you know, a storyline. Yeah. And they said, well, we would need the book. And in, in, at this point, it was seven weeks. And so I had this idea that I had worked on five years ago about this guy who is, shot back and re-enters himself at the age of 19, but this time with his awareness and his memories of this previous existence. And I couldn't make it work. I couldn't find something big enough to make the, the story happen. You know, it's like when I first wrote it, uh, he goes back and he makes a killing and in remembering things and betting betting on them, but then what? You know, it's yeah. like you have this huge event, but then what happens from this event? And so I just set it aside. And so I had 60 pages of the story done and I shared it with a couple of people and their response always was, wow, this is incredible. And it was like, yeah, but I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> so it was, it was, partly because I only had seven weeks that it was a sense of just being compressed further and further and further down. And one of the things I think every author that I know of goes through when they have a great idea is accepting that in many cases, the great idea is not enough, that it has to be reshaped into something that actually is suitable for the audience. And in this case, what I was missing was that Ethan had not been coming face to face with himself. Yeah. That was what I that was what I needed. So then it was like everything started falling into place. Okay, so he goes back with a purpose. What is the worst purpose that he could have? And that is this urgency to save his brother's life. So the external drama is happening, and then all of a sudden there are these moments that start coming up. And the one that really shaped it for me is Ethan goes to, you know, you don't always write a story in, in sequence. It's not written in temporal order. But in this particular case, Ethan had driven down to see his, the woman who was going to become his wife. And there's that sense of actually watching myself be involved in this story. I was both the writer and the observer as I put this down. So he goes in, he has to be there because it's the day that his wife-to-be has uh, come back from a summer abroad. And one of the things that had driven her to take this trip with her friends was the fact that Ethan had never been able to confess that he actually loved her. And so she had left with the intention of trying to decide 
am I willing to accept this guy with his limitations or should I move on? Should I break up and move on? So she had come back knowing that she wanted to commit to living her life with this guy, flaws and all. And for Ethan, it was the beginning of this gradual separation from one direction in his life and taking another that would lead to the point where he ends up divorcing her and basically failing to be the husband that he needed to be. So he walks into this house and the first person he sees is the mother, her mother. And the last time he had seen her, she was in a wheelchair. And the last time he had seen the room that she puts him in is when he went in to sign the divorce papers. And the last time that he had seen the house was at the reception after the mother's funeral, which was also the last time that he had seen his ex-wife. And so when his soon-to-be former wife walks into the room, he breaks down and, and cries for the first time as an adult. And at that point, there was that sense of, okay, I know what it is that I have to do with this story. That was the turning point for me. Nice. Oh, that's awesome. And seven weeks. Wow. I mean, even for a fast rider, that was talk about compressed. <laughs> my editor, I, I think, actually, I think my editor was a little upset that I made the target date. There was that feeling, some of her responses when we got into the editorial process was there was a real sense of irritation, like, <laughs> you know, you're not supposed to be able to do this. It was, really, it was very cute. It was very cute. <laughs> Well, so that actually sort of answers some of my questions had to do with, um, I, we'll, we'll still cover some of them anyway, but um, I had some questions about research and, and I had one question um, on some of these things. Now I see you had such a short period of time that you weren't taking your time with this, but so I get to the last page of this book and I'm on my Kindle and I <clears throat> turn the page and it's just blank and, um, and I go back and I'm just staring at this last page. And I've got this amazing feeling that you get as a writer sometimes, probably uh, anyone who is in touch with their creative side, uh, like recognizes this feeling of it just feels like um, there's all this energy just like building up in your chest and, and you just feel like you need to be focusing, like there's something here that you just need to be thinking about, really thinking about. And I was looking at this last page and kind of talking to God, because that's what I do, just talk to God. And I'm like, okay, what is it that I'm so like about this book? It's just so hit me. And I was just like, this story is exactly the kind of story. And it has nothing at all to do with plot or anything else. Just there is just feeling of this story. I'm like, this is exactly the kind of story that I want to write. Like I, I have a piece that I think could be that later, but then I, I just, um, I just took some time, even though you had already ruined my productivity for the day, I was like, well, I might as well take some more time and really think about it. Cause I wanted to capture that emotion that I was feeling and try to put some words to it so I could do something with it as a writer, aside from the fact that I had just really had the best six hours as a reader. Um, and I was thinking, okay, so, so what is it that moves us so deeply that we just feel like this, even though we can't exactly put our finger on it. And I, and I wondered, you know, was this a story that either four and a half years before or during the, the seven weeks of the writing that you had ever had that moment of feeling like um, either I really just really want this to work and I just want to sit and think about it and daydream about it or, or that sometimes, you know, things just come to you because you actually slow down enough to think and daydream, which I do so much less of in the 21st century than I did in the 20th century. Anyway, I didn't know if, if any of this was something that, um, that as a writer, you have felt about this book or any other book where you're like, this is one of the ones that like, it just really moves me in the deepest part of me. And I need to get it down on paper? The answer is yes. Um, but it was when the original idea came to me, 
almost five years ago now. It was not not during the writing. The writing was so intense. Yeah. There were moments in the writing when there was that feeling, but um, very briefly, very briefly. With the original I just, I knew I had something special, yeah. but it was just not complete. And when I went back to it time after time, there was a sense of, on the one hand, and I had reread it five or six times at this point. And um, pushed it around in different directions. I actually rewrote the first section a couple of times you know, I, I will often do this. I will, it's like working with a sketch pad. I will go back to these concepts and I'll sort of mold them a little bit in between actual writing projects. It's, it's downtime for me. In this particular case, I just, I felt like I couldn't get it to the point where the story was as good as the concept deserved it to be. Yeah. And so yeah, it's really nice to hear you say that you feel like it it, it works. That that really is very good. Yeah, that's the kind of it's it's the kind of writing I suppose painters feel the same way. Like there's there's a certain kind of book, there's a certain kind of painting that when it's done, you're like that was that was one of the ones. A transition point. Yeah. 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 I don't know if you've given it um, the kind of thought that, because um, I am not giving you, uh, you know, any uh, room for thinking here <laughs> on a recorded interview, but, um, but if you have any thoughts that come to mind during the course of the interview uh, about um, sharing ideas with other writers about how to tap into that feeling, I'm sure that there are people listening who have at least, you know, the one story. For me, there's this one story I don't want to Oh, I, this, this is the way I talk about it to myself. I don't want to ruin that story by trying to force it out right now. Like it's not working and I don't want to just force it, but I, but I absolutely am determined to figure out, you know, what it is, these missing parts and, and I love it. And it's also frustrating. And, um, you know, it's not very often that writers talk about those things that have taken a long time to, to pull out and then finally to find that they've made something beautiful. I don't know if it's something that you've ever like talked to other writers about. No, I haven't, but I, it's a very, it's a, it's both valid. And I think a very important point, Kitty. Um, there, there are a couple of issues that have to be unpacked here. Um, the first is um, I'm going to talk about fate for just a second, because I do feel like it's important as far as understanding this particular concept. My entry into faith actually came through meditation. I was introduced to the whole element of faith through um, people involved in the arts community in continental Europe. I was living in Germany and my closest friends at the time were opera singers and they would have a gathering usually once every two or three months, sometimes a bit longer of other people within the arts community. These are dancers, orchestral people, and other opera singers who um, would gather for a weekend, basically as a retreat. And there was a monk who had come for this particular time. And it was the first time that I had ever connected with someone from the faith community on anything more than an intellectual level. And so throughout my my life, I have spent a number of experiences. And this is as, I mean, I, I met the writer in residence at the Baptist College at Oxford. I was, you know, basically brought back into the Protestant fold, but much of my growth has come through the Catholic and the Russian Orthodox communities. And one of the things that the monastic traditions, both this is going back as far as the Desert Fathers in the third century, right through the current Orthodox and Catholic communities, is that an acolyte, when working on these issues of meditation and personal growth, um, 
are required to, and it's interesting because all of these tenants, these sort of instruction panels are one and the same for all of these communities, regardless of how many differences and conflicts and arguments and even wars that have happened between these groups over the years, there are certain basic constructs that don't change. And one of these is that the acolyte may set no goals. And the reason for this is that um, there is this passage for those of your uh, audience who are not familiar with the, um, with the scriptures, there's this passage that speaks of the old self is gone and the new self has come in. <clears throat> and in this internal inspection that happens with meditation, one of the things that you are constantly confronting is the fact that the old self is still there. Now you can rewrite this any way you want to, to make it harmonize with the scriptures. But the fact is the old self is still there. And one of the tenets that comes with the creative process is the fact that the old self wants you to fail. Yeah. The, yeah. the basic structure here is that if the deeper you go into the creative process, the more you are releasing the hold of the ego. The only way that you can really connect with the creative self is by going beyond who you are as a personality and to connecting to something that's much deeper. Whether you want to accept this comes from a higher source as it's you know the AA side or a universal spirit, it makes no difference as far as this is concerned. You are in effect interpreting something that is beyond words. But there is part of you that is enormously threatened by this. And so, in my opinion, what is happening with you right now with this project and with others who feel like that there is this one project they've got to get done is that you are setting up unnecessary barriers to success. And success in this point is defined in two different ways. One is satisfying the creative urge doing what you can to the utmost with the gift that you have. The other is satisfying the commercial requirements of a good story. Now these may or may not be in harmony, mm -hmm. but for the moment, both of these have to be satisfied if you want to make this into a commercial book. But it still comes down to dealing with this root element of how do you establish a structure where you are allowing yourself to grow beyond your comfort zone and effectively arrive at a point where you have taken this idea and you have grown it into something that is truly satisfying, that you feel lives up to whatever it is that you have? And the answer is that you can't go into this, in my opinion, ever and be successful if you start from the point of you have to have everything perfect before you begin, what you need to do is to start sketching right now. And you have to keep a separate file where what you're really working on is allowing this thing to generate, to take the seed and to grow into whatever it is that it's going to become. And again, set no goals. This doesn't mean just setting the goal of it has to be great, but setting the goal of what the structure is. One of the things, and this is the other side of this, one of the things that we have to accept in creating a story is really what we're doing is we are making a series of choices. We are facing the empty page and we are selecting this path and then this path and then this path, but it doesn't mean the other paths are wrong. Now, this has become increasingly important for me because in order to become successful as a screenwriter, one of the things that I had to accept was that the defensiveness that I often took into dealing with editors, publishers, buyers from the film world was that my vision for this particular story is not the only correct vision. It's just a vision. Yeah. And it, the same is true for what happened with Burden of Proof where I started off in one very different direction. 
And gradually over the the years that followed, I began to see that in order to make this into something big, I had to grow beyond where it was that I actually had seen initially as the story's direction. And I think this really is what you're coming up against right now, is that you have this ideal for what you want to do with this story that really has more to do with you as the artist than it does with the story itself. Yeah. You see yourself using this as a portal for entering into something else. Well, that may or may not happen, but restricting yourself from working on the creative side in order to satisfy this other thing, which is, to be frank, ego-driven, doesn't help anyone. And as a result, the product is not happening. So I would say you need to take a very different dual perspective. First of all, on the story as a product, and then the story as a creative project. And as far as the product is concerned, you don't really begin looking at this until the story has reached its first draft stage, yeah. which it hasn't. So you need to go back to the creative project and insert an element of discipline into your work and look at this from the standpoint of you have to work at this every day, regardless of whether it's perfect or not, and whether your outside circumstances are perfect and grow beyond. That is awesome. You know, I was just thinking of a couple of characters in um, in a different book that I'm working on right now. Um, and I was thinking, okay, so one of the problems is, is that um, one of them feels like they're getting really close and they're letting this person in, but their best friend is saying, but, but you're not, you still, you're keeping everybody, you know, six inches away, not really close. There's still a little bit of an arm's length distance that you want to keep with people because you still got something, you know, closed off about yourself that you don't want to share. And I'm thinking when you said that about that, there's still this, this other ego part of you that, um, you know, there's lots of great things that fear does for you. It protects you from things, you know, guilt protects you from having to um, go through the same stupid mistake over and over again. But when we let those things take over and they keep us from doing the things that are important to us, I'm just thinking this is, this is the, as far as things that I've been thinking about a lot in the last year. And I, I love reading neuroscience books. And now there's so many things where neuroscience and psychology and some other things are kind of all overlapping. And in my mind, they're all overlapping together with story. And so I see all these different places where, you know, there's a, there's a character or sometimes I'm the character. I'm the one who's keeping something just a little, a little bit of a distance. It can't hurt me if I don't let it all the way in and give myself fully to it, you know, that sort of thing. I just think it's very exciting to be thinking about it in terms of um, not just the characters I'm creating, not just the relationships I have in my own life, but even my relationship with how far I'm willing to open myself up to ideas and stories that I come across, you know, in the ether, in my head or whatever. Oh, I love talking about writing with writers. <laughs> Okay. All right. So that was awesome and deep. And, um, and maybe we'll add a couple more, seriously, not to, um, oh, I don't want to walk away from that idea real quick. Um, because hopefully listeners you're thinking about like, is there any place in, in my story or in my writing journey where I could open myself up more when I could understand a little bit better that there's two parts of my mind and one part is going to find ways to sabotage me and tell me that it's protecting myself. So like, that's definitely something I want you to think about. And in addition to that, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about some of the things that as I was reading, I was like, does Davis know how to do this himself? Does he do this? Does he do Cause like, there were so many things that, um, that, and, and let me just start with the surfing was the big question. I'm like, has Davis been a surfer in life? Because the way that you wrote all the surfing scenes, like they weren't just kind of describing and like good writing, but, but I felt like, like the person describing it had done it and felt all of these feelings. I don't know. It just, it just felt um, richer to me. And I was just wondering, <laughs> so have you been a surfer? All my life. It came out on the page. <laughs> good. good. I'm very glad. 
Wow. Yeah, uh, surfing is a big part of my life. It's okay. Really and do you still get to do it much now? I, I don't know that there's um, much surf where you live now, but I, I don't well, know. Well, Oxford is the furthest that you can get in England from the, from the ocean. So oh, <laughs> it great. is literally the furthest away you can get. Um, so, and also the water here is just embarrassingly cold. The, the people who surf here, um, they just, they have an extra layer of skin or something. I'm, I'm just astonished at how easy they are able to put up with the frigid temperatures. But literally in August, you can have water that is um, Oregon State cold. I mean, we're talking maybe eight, nine degrees above freezing. It's wow. really, it's, it's very cold. So wow. most of my surfing nowadays takes place when I'm back in the United States. Yeah, yeah. And have you surfed the, the let's see, would it be the east coast of Florida where your story takes place? Yes, we've had a home there for... Um, gosh, 15 years. We ended up selling it last year because of my wife's work. We knew this year we were not going to be able to get back. And then look what happened with COVID. Right. We couldn't come back. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, man. Well, I have to say, I, I had already known that you had lived um, quite a lot. I didn't know, you know, how much of the year, however it worked, but I knew that you had lived in Florida a lot. And it was really interesting because um, <laughs> I'm one of those um, readers who uh, it's probably partially a 21st century. I have a short attention span um, and there's too many books and too little time and like a combination of things, but also just, I think personality wise, I don't really like um, big, long descriptions about things, but the way that you described things, particularly as somebody who had seen it in one period of um, time and then also at another period it was really really interesting and again made me feel like yep davis really knows this area because it doesn't sound like um research or book learning but then it made me wonder now i have read other books of yours um that had uh legal aspects and this one might have been the first one um that had science aspects that i'm remembering at least but um I was really interesting, interested in like how much research did you have to do into, and I hesitate to say too much in case somebody's listening going, oh, well, once you use that word that I think I know what this book's about, I really don't want to ruin this for anybody because it was so good just reading it blind. But, but uh, some of the science and stuff that you uh, had in the book, I'm just wondering, are you using a lot of things that are just um, of interest to you and you already know things about them the way that I might add some neuroscience stuff into my books for, I don't know why, but I would, but, or did you have to do a lot of research into some of these things? One of the things that's happened in, um, okay, I've had more than 70 books published now. And one of the things that's happened during this time is um, coming to terms with what research really means. Um, and, and all of this started back when my first big break happened. I, I was, um, when we were able to live from the writing, we weren't actually able to live from the writing, but Isabella had been granted the opportunity to do her doctorate at Oxford. And so we both left our day jobs before really the finances were in place. And when we got over here, I did two more books. And then I had an opportunity to start with a new publisher who was looking, this was Thomas Nelson, they were looking to set up a new division that was going to go into um, the mainstream shelves with what at the time was strictly labeled as Christian fiction. And I was approached by the editor and the head of the house to, um, they said, you know, we, we like your writing, we think you have potential, but do you have a big enough idea to justify us taking you on for this? And I had a story that I had been playing around with for some time that was based on a book that had just recently come out called Byzantium by John Julius Norwich. And the only reason that I had heard about this book was the, um, the history department and the theology department at Oxford were both just up in arms over the fact, not that this book had been published, 
was that this book had been so successful. It had sold something like 5 million copies. And this is a history book about the third century, third and fourth century. Um, and what had these people tied up in knots was the fact that this guy was not a historian or a theologian. He was a spy. He, was, he had been a spy. He had been a member of the uh, British public service. Let's see, he had been a radio announcer and he'd been a television <laughs> game show host, but he had become passionate about this transition, this point where the Christian church came out of the catacombs and moved up to the point where it was the established religion of the late Roman empire. And there was a turning point where all of this happened. And I decided that I wanted to write a Dr. Zhivago style story sort of the romance adventure that took place in the six months of this transition from the death of Constantine to the start of the last civil war in Rome that basically pitted the two sons who were following the, the Roman temple religions of, of the, the old structure with the one son who was following the new religion of his father, Christianity. And basically this six month struggle is what has in many respects resulted in the, the church structure that we know as Christianity today. A lot of it came out of this, including the Nicene Creed. So I had, um, I guess, I pitched it well. I had this opportunity offered to me. It was uh, the biggest advance I'd ever gotten. And I went to the president of the college where my wife was doing her doctorate. And I said that I'd been given this opportunity, but I had no idea what to do now that I had it. And his response was to give me a position of what's called a visiting scholar, which is usually it's a postgraduate position at Oxford University, which means that for this period of one year, I am accepted as a non-paid member of the faculty of Oxford University. Wow. I was assigned a tutor who was the bishop of the, the Orthodox Bishop of England and also the president of the theology faculty and a second uh, tutor who was the leading, the at the time, the leading scholar in the world on the late Roman empire. Wow. And obviously, um, you know, I, I go into my tutorial the first time and they said, you know, we want you to read these. Or, you know, the bishop said, like, okay, I want you to go read these three books and then come back to me in two weeks. And these are, these are scholarly tomes. And then I went into the other one and he said the same thing. You know, he said, okay, well, you need to get a foundation in X and X, which is the economics of the late Roman Empire and the structure of the, you know, the persecution of the Christians and stuff like this. I felt it's like, okay, so you, you need to go read these four books and come back to me in two weeks. So I had seven books to read in two weeks and I had to get the first pages of the book done. Wow. So I went into my first class, which was also assigned. I needed to go to several classes and these are, these are, <laughs> these are graduate level classes at Oxford. And the first of these was the economics of the late Roman empire. And in the graduate courses, all of the professors wear their robes. So the guy comes in in the robe, walks up to the blackboard, and he starts writing in a language I have never seen before. And he gets about a third of the way through the line, and he says, now, this is what was found six weeks ago in this ship that they just dredged out of the harbor at um, Alexandria. And he says, it's very interesting because of da 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 da, -da. And then he said, oh, um, can I just make sure that everyone in the class has a, um, has a working knowledge of Aramaic? And <laughs> I, I just, I couldn't even raise my hand. I just sat there and then there, obviously someone else had. So his, his translation was into ancient Greek, which he wrote down below it. So I went back. I, my next tutorial, I hadn't finished the books and I went back and I sat down with the tutor, my, the bishop who became a very dear friend. 
and said, um, you know, I just didn't think I could do this. I was going to have to, you know, I didn't know if I was going to continue the book or whatever, but I knew that, um, that this, this whole thing was just so far removed from who I was. And he said something like, um, do you know that um, every single one of the students in that class wished they were a published author? And he said, um, they all know that you have no background in this, but they know that you have this publishing contract that most of them would kill for. So that at least made me willing to sit there a little bit longer. And he said, the key to research is um, what you need to do over the next month. He said, stop working on the project for a month. He said, that's all you'll need. And during this time, what you need to do is to settle on the questions that you have to answer in order to get the book finished. Oh, yeah. And then he said, only find one answer. He said, just one answer. You're not researching this as a scholar. You are researching this as a commercial novelist. Find one answer and move on. He said, everything else that you do beyond this point is simply your own and he did use these words, idle curiosity, <laughs> so that there's a clear separation between the work that has to be done for the project and everything else. He says, you have a lifetime to continue with this if you want to. And I didn't. I did another, um, after I finished the story, I did another two or three months, and then I had an opportunity um, to write what became the first screenplay for the uh, Walden Media project that came out as uh, it was titled Amazing Grace, the story of William Wilberforce. I had, right, okay, we have some mutual friends on that project, yeah. And when all of this was happening, there was this sense of understanding that it really wasn't the lessons about Byzantium that were so important, it was the lessons about how to treat this as a component of the creative discipline. And um, yeah, I think maybe that's going to be the point where we have to close. I need to get back to work. Yeah. <laughs> I need to get back to my day job. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, and, and let me just um, boil that down into a, a few words if I heard you right. So part of what we're saying to listeners is um, using the ad advice that you got, figure out what the questions are that have to be answered. Find one answer one that answer. you can work with. And then everything else is not part of work. Everything else is just because you wanted to do it, but don't do it during work time because now you're supposed yeah. to be working on the book. You have to understand that the people that you're dealing with as part of your readership are not people who are concerned with whether this is the latest thinking on a particular concept. It is whether this is valid, whether this feels valid. Yeah. So for example, in Burden of Proof, I had two attorneys, two trial attorneys that were kind enough to help me with this. And Isabella, as a lawyer, is no help at all because she's never been in a courtroom. Oh, right. so, so I have these two lawyers. One of them was extremely adept at structuring the project, but his, his work was useless as far as the story was concerned. And the other one was in the middle of a trial, and he was using me as a sort of like a way to, to vent steam. And so we would have these conversations with him driving to the, to the courthouse and he would argue my case, but it was my specific case that he was arguing rather than the, you know, the thematic structure of how a courtroom drama is going to be unfolding. You know, I don't need that background. I need to know what a lawyer would be doing in this particular case. So, there, there were particular moments where I literally just lifted what he was saying and put it on the page. One of these was when the investigator, the private investigator, finds out that the one of the people that they needed for a subpoena in, in order to find out actually who was behind the threat was had vanished. And supposedly, this woman had resigned from her position as a senior executive and then the PI goes to Bahamas following this little tiny trail of evidence and discovers that she's still listed as a shareholder 
and the parent company, which owns the company, which is behind the threat. So she's only removed one step. But the problem is, at this point in time, the law has now changed, but at that point in time, the United States could not legally find out who were shareholders in a Bahamian trust. So what does the lawyer do? He needs the information, but he can't be party to this. And so what he does is he steps out of the car and the PI tells our, our guy, Ethan, what happened and how he got it. So that when the lawyer gets back in the car, he is one step removed from the source. And all he has is the information that Ethan passes on. I have heard this. It yeah. can't be used in court, but it does give him a direction as far as asking the questions are concerned. So these are the things that have to happen in terms of making the story work. But yeah. everything else about the courtroom structure and how the laws work and, you know, all of this, nah, I don't need it. I enjoy it. Yeah. It's part of my wife's you know, world, but I don't need it. Not for the story. This is great advice. This is great advice. And uh, it helps me to understand uh, how you can get so many good books written in such a short period of time if you're writing two to four books a year. So yay for us. Writing, writing two books a year now plus three screenplays. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. obviously you are advice <laughs> that, that I can follow. Thank you so much. Where can people find out more about you and your books, Davis? Um, davisbond.com if I continue with Thomas Locks and the Thomas Locks well the, I mean the website is up now so they can find out about that and um, yeah that's, that's, Excellent. and Facebook and all of that but you know as, as Davis Bun probably just as Davis Bun right now yeah okay yeah. excellent well I have to say everybody you need to go read this book because it was awesome I loved it so much <laughs> Davis thank you. thank you again for taking the time we really appreciate it you're very welcome. I wish you all the best. Go write that book. 